A good Tuesday morning to you, and welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you uh, alongside our massive team of uh, cheese producer Sarah Hoyle's technical producer, Samuel G. Brooks. We're going to have to start rolling credits soon, I think, because uh, people are going to lose track of the team. We have credits? Now, now that it's so enormous. Yeah, we're, we're working on credits, <laughs> oh, uh, which is going to be great, rolling credits at the end of the show. We'd hate for people to lose track of, of who it is that's making things happen around here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, whether you're listening or watching live right now, whether you're going to be catching it later in the day, we have a great show coming up. Uh, you're not going to want to miss a minute of it. We're going to be following up on some stories uh, that we've been covering. We'll be digging a little bit deeper into a couple of the stories that we are, uh, well, that we touched on yesterday, and we'll be teeing up uh, some of the things that are, well, that matter to you, quite frankly, as, as real talkers and of members of our audience, uh, our barometer. Uh, for that, the way that we gauge that is our email inbox, talk at ryanjesperson.com. Um, it's where you're in touch with us, and it's where you let us know what's on your mind. Uh, so we're going to be getting into some of your emails today, including one from Chris, who wrote in and said, I've never sent an email to a show before, but I care too much about my province to not say something. I'm 28 years old, and, and, and then Chris goes on, and we're going to get into that email. Uh, in just a moment, Andrew Parker is going to join us. He's co-founder of the Black Teachers Association of Alberta. You, you probably remember, if you're a regular audience member here on Real Talk, who could forget Andrew Parker's participation on one of our uh, roundtables, one of our Real Talk roundtables during Black History Month. Uh, he joined uh, photographer and artist Eric Domond and uh, political strategist and political pundit Sam Hart to Kest for just a wonderful conversation. Uh, Andrew, a, a former pro basketball player himself, a passionate educator and uh, and an advocate for this young man in Edmonton, this 14-year-old boy. Um, we'll use his first name, Pazzo, a student at Rosslyn School who was subjected to, uh, well, nothing short of a beating. That's what it was. He was hospitalized. And um, and uh, Pazzo's family is demanding justice here. Andrew's been advocating on their behalf. He's been one of the people that's been advocating on their behalf. And, and we're going to talk to him uh, about that in just a second. A little later on in the show, we wanted to let you know that a, a very uh, prominent and and by prominent, I'm not talking about community stature. I'm not in, I'm not talking about the fact that no one can ignore it because there's flashing neon lights and a huge billboard and a ton of traffic. But prominent because it, uh, well, quite frankly, it's a, a facility, it's a community hub uh, that has been saving people's lives. People's lives are saved at a supervised consumption site in Edmonton uh, that's going to be closing. It's going to be closing, and we're going to be talking to, this is just sort of a continuation of the narrative here in the province of Alberta, where the provincial government, w with really no appetite for the science around supervised consumption, has been withdrawing funding. Uh, finding reasons to pull funding and closing down either centers or or plans for centers in in places like Lethbridge and Red Deer and in Edmonton. We're going to talk to uh, Petra Schultz. She's the co-founder of Mom Stop the Harm. Uh, she lost her uh, beautiful boy Danny to an opioid overdose years ago, and and Petra has has dedicated her life, quite frankly, um, to advocating for science based for evidence based programs and government approaches and funding around supervised consumption. She's going to join 
uh, Dr. Elaine Hishka, who's uh, a renowned uh, scientist and researcher. Uh, it, you, you know Dr. Hishka, I'm sure, if you've watched this show before, an assistant professor at the university's uh, School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. She researches substance use, and uh, she's previously co-chair of the Provincial Minister of Health's Opioid Emergency Response Commission. That was between 2017 and 2019. So those two will join us today. We're also going to talk to the mayor of Fort McMurray, uh, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, Don Scott. Uh, yesterday, Fort McMurray, uh, or at least a short time ago, declaring a, a state of emergency their COVID infection rates lead the country. That's not a good thing. You don't want to be at the top of that list. Uh, Fort McMurray is, and it's experiencing real problems in rural areas and in work camps. Uh, meantime, uh, some of the things that are they're supposed to be going on there aren't happening. And so we're going to find out from his worship why declare the state of emergency, emergency, what's the significance. And because I know some of you are going to ask me to do it, I want to let you know that, of course, we will ask for follow up on that 911 story that we were covering. You remember Fort McMurray is, was one of the communities uh, impacted by the province going to a centralized 911 dispatch. And we're going to get an update from the mayor, although I suspect and I'm going to be fair to Don Scott. We'll let him put it in his own words. Um, he, he's a savvy community leader, but I suspect there there might be some politics at play. I don't know that we're going to get uh, as candid of an answer as we're looking for. And that's because I suspect, again, that the municipal government there and in Red Deer and in Lethbridge, and you remember even Nehead Nenshi, the mayor of Calgary, was on the show talking about this. I know that they're working with the province to try to sort this out. So, so maybe they're not going to want to drag it into the public discourse right now we'll find out we only know if we ask and so that's what we're going to do and we'll wrap up the show today uh speaking with uh, a lawyer uh, and, i mean the fact that she's a lawyer really has nothing to do with the fact that she's going to be on the show ashley antonio is a covid survivor and her story as a covid long hauler so to speak you're going to notice on this show we're going to be talking more and more about long covid because now um, as time goes on, unfortunately, we have more and more anecdotal evidence plus early research to shed some light on, on to what this is all about and to what the symptoms look like or, or what the implications or ramifications are. Um, Ashley's a relatively young woman, uh, relatively healthy, uh, who, who got COVID. And if you feel like, geez, Jesperson's really kind of spelling out her story here. That's the point. Uh, I guess what I could say is Ashley is not a 97-year-old asthmatic, and she's still experiencing very real health issues months and months and months after so-called recovery from COVID-19. I invited you yesterday to, to invoke our hashtag, Real Talk RJ, powered by Park Power, of course, and tell us your long COVID story. And we're going to continue to uh, to curate these we're going to continue to collect these and, and show them and we're going to be showing you some of the early responses when we uh, tee up a conversation with Ashley Antonio that's coming up in about we'll say an hour and five maybe an hour and ten minutes from now uh, but story after story after story and we're just getting started here and I think this conversation is really important Dr. Joe Vipond who joined us yesterday the emergency doctor in Calgary saying that you know they expect 10% as a conservative estimate, 10% of all COVID cases to encounter or deal with or ultimately live with some form of long COVID. And uh, so those are astronomical numbers, and it's something we need to be more aware of. And and I know for a fact, because I'm human, just like you, and, and we hear our friends talking, and we know how we feel personally, and I know a bunch of people are looking at this third wave, and they're looking at the numbers, and uh, public health officials and physicians and, you know, infectious disease experts and pharmacists for that matter. And everybody else are sounding the alarm and you're going, yeah, but like people are tired and it's getting really nice out and patios are open and uh, I kind of want a road trip with my friends and I want to get out there and we're going to try to make sure that some of these stories are on our radar as much as they need to be. We're going to get into the show uh, with Andrew Parker in just a second. Want to remind you that every morning our presenting sponsor of this show is Bitcoin Well. They're headquartered in Edmonton. As a matter of fact, getting set to move into beautiful new digs downtown. They've been building their team uh, exponentially. I mean, business is booming over there. Proudly headquartered out of Edmonton, but Bitcoin ATMs 
across the country. If even right there you've got a question, Bitcoin ATMs, wait a second, I thought Bitcoin was, wait, what, ATMs? How? They love to talk crypto. You can find them under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right, we're going to be talking about a couple of things on tomorrow's show, and we also want to tee those up just before we get to Andrew Parker. We're going to be talking about curriculum tomorrow. We're going to be talking about death ed. What's that all about? We're going to talk to a grief educator tomorrow. Jeremy Allen is his name. He comes highly recommended by some real talkers, and so our team has been talking with him, and we're looking forward to that conversation. Constantly, uh, things going on behind the scenes. We try to keep our finger on the pulse of everything, and you help us out with that. We want to present. We want to represent the audience that joins us across Canada and around the world every single day. Just got an email from a fella from Rory who tunes in from Scotland every single day. He says, when it comes to putting issues on my radar that might not otherwise be, says this show's a gold mine. And Rory's given us an interview suggestion out of Scotland. We're going to follow up on that today. Absolutely love the engagement of this audience. Chris took some time to send us an email. Talk at ryanjesperson.com. Says, I've never sent an email to a show before, but I care too much about this province to not say something. I'm 28. Uh, I've lived in Calgary my entire life. And up until this current government, I've never even considered moving out of Alberta. I, I, I work as a youth mental health counselor, and I'm one of these, you know, the overpaid public service workers, says Chris. I've never voted conservative, but my issues with this current government go well beyond ideological differences. He says, listening to your show is, has, has made me realize, again, this government doesn't especially seem to care about Alberta. They don't seem to care about our parks. They don't seem to care about our public sector, our education, our health care. Says I could go on and on, but you know what it was that prompted... The email, Ryan, it was it was your your interview last week on plant proteins said the fact that the government couldn't dig up two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in core funding for the plant protein alliance beyond ridiculous, especially for a government that's supposed to be so big on rural investment. He says, maybe it's just me, but do you really think that a farmer's going to care if their crops are being used to make a veggie burger? <laughs> I think they're going to care about the fact they know they can provide for their family and have some financial security. And then not wanting for us to take money from for Ottawa for $10 a day child care because we don't want Ottawa telling us what to do. Fine, says Chris, but then let's actually do something, right? Let's actually do something to show me that you're working to improve the day-to-day -day life of every Albertan. All we're getting now is political grandstanding. Chris says, I want Alberta to be seen nationally the way I know so many Albertans see it, a province that's hardworking, that looks after one another, that does the right thing regardless of whose idea it is. The writing's on the wall when it comes to the energy economy. He says, we're probably not getting back to $100 a barrel. The world's moving away from oil and gas, and, and, and unless Alberta adapts, we're going to become the rust belt of the U.S. This province needs a leader who has some foresight and can make the unpopular but necessary decisions to begin diversifying our economy for generations to come. He says, you know, there's a quote from the movie, The Trial of the Chicago Seven. He says that I think it sums up a lot of people's feelings about Premier Jason Kenney and this government. He says Sasha Baron Cohen's character, Abby Hoffman, is asked if he has contempt for his government. And he responds by saying, let me tell you, it's nothing like the contempt this government has for me. He says, sorry if I'm rambling. I'm sending this after a very long 16 hour shift. I love the show. Keep holding people accountable. That from Chris in Calgary. Absolutely appreciate that email, Chris, and keep them coming. Thanks very much. Let's turn our attention to the story that we lead off with today. We touched on this yesterday. Obviously, an extremely troubling incident, and many are fearing that it's been a trend at a school, at Rosslyn School in North Edmonton, where a 14-year-old boy, a grade 8 student, uh, we'll call him Pazzo, was leaving to catch a bus back on April 16th when about seven students chased him down, tackled him to the ground, wrenched his neck, essentially beat him. Uh, he was hospitalized, his family now, and advocates on his behalf demanding answers for what appears to be, uh, for all intents and purposes, a racially fueled attack. The N-word was heard as Pazzo was being beaten by these young men 
Andrew Parker has been advocating on the family's behalf. He's a good friend of this show. He's co-founder of the Black Teachers Association of Alberta. My man, welcome back, and thanks for making time for us today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ryan, for having me. Um, I wish it was under better circumstances, but um, being able to speak on behalf of the community and, of course, educators and, of course, the beautiful city of champions that I love with my whole heart and soul is something that I will take advantage of. And I do also want to apologize to, to CBC and CTV and a few others who have reached out. I was deferring most of those uh, interview requests to the family. But uh, Ryan and I have a really good relationship and I wanted to make sure that I honored our friendship and also honored the family and, and the whole entire community of Edmonton with this interview. So thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. And, and we appreciate you giving us the exclusive. We know it's an important message and I know a lot of people are going to be interested in, in hearing your voice here. Let, let me ask you something before we get into the story itself. Um, your opinion on something really played a significant role in an editorial conversation we had yesterday on the show and and that was whether or not to show the video of this young man being beaten. Now, I noticed that on your social media, you said, I am not going to share the video of my young brother being beaten. Can you take us into the decision as to why you did not want people to see it? Well, there's there's a few different things at play. Number one is intergenerational trauma. Um there's brothers and sisters from our community that this happened to 20 and 30 years ago when there was no YouTube, there was no social media, there was no internet, um, there was no way, there was no cameras. So some of the situations that happened to the community 20, 10, 15 years ago, we never got an opportunity to, to, to get that justice or even to have that rectified. And not only that, I was aware that some kids in the community, if they see that, it, it's it's traumatizing to them too. Now, when the CBC and CTV were able to get a, a like like a like some of those videos, then we waited for the family's consent and said, "Is this something that you want?" And the family said, "Yes," so that we can bring more awareness and get more support. From my Facebook standpoint, when I first saw it, I said, "I don't want to just relive that." Um, because there's some people in my community who went through that and I was very conscious of them, but I did want us to address it. And the best way for us to address it is to start talking, start feeling and start creating and start building and start listening to the community who's asking for changes. Andrew, when you first had this story come across your radar, I mean, was, was it the video you saw first? Did the family reach out? How, how did this first get on your radar and what was your very first reaction your very first thought i'm going to give a a shout out to a sister from the somali community uh from ontario sahra she uh she reached out to me and said hey have you seen this video and i sent her a list of questions like how long has the video been out for um are the parents okay is the boy getting medical treatment um what is going on with the kids involved has this institution addressed it? Has that institution addressed it? Who from those places have done something? And then from there, the very last thing I said was, I want mom's number and I wanna be able to talk to the family and make sure they're okay. So I was reached out to by the black community, uh, the Ugandan association and the Somali community. And they said, this is going on. Um, what are we gonna do to address it? And my thing is like, you know, I definitely understand that there's issues in the community, but my job is just to amplify the wishes of the family. You know, I'm not here to, you know, overtake someone else's cause or challenges and say, hey, this is Andrew, he's doing this. I'm only here to say this community member needs help and I'm going to help them and this is how I'm going to do it. So they reached out to me. I was able to meet mom, the sweetest woman in the world. She's Ugandan. My kids are half Ugandan. My queen is Ugandan. Um, my kid's grandma is Ugandan. They call her Jaja. So we actually had a conversation in some of the words I know in Ugandan with mom. And that meant a lot to me because that's my community too. I mean, I'm Jamaican and Canadian and Grenadian. You can see the flag. But, you know, in the Black community, in the diaspora, there's really great pieces of unity there. And uh, as soon as I found out where the community was, I went down to Roslyn, we met with the family and we got on camera and we talked about a few things and we asked for changes uh, to these institutions and we asked for accountability uh, in this situation. 
I'm getting some interesting comments on our live chat. Um, Ustock says beating is not a strong enough word for what happened to this young man from from Roslyn School. Uh, you know, Tawny says with those punks that assaulted this young man, can we say, you know, what the hell's wrong with the parents? I mean, can some of the responsibility maybe be put on them? Uh, you know, uh, others. I mean, there's actually a whole bunch of people talking about the parents here. Um, Sharon says we need to not only listen, but hear what this Agreed. community is saying. Laurel says, I don't need to see the video to care about this young man and his family. Um, you know, Daniel says, my son sent me a short video and a large part of the problem can be attributed to social media. It's worth pointing out, if I'm understanding this story correctly, the video is actually recorded and posted by one mm -hmm. of the young people involved in the assault. I mean, which blows my mind. I mean, to, to be honest, I'm grateful that they posted it uh, because it's drawing attention to something that, that has obviously not uh, been addressed and not been adequately dealt with. Um, Andrew, when it comes to the conversations that you've been privy to with Edmonton's Ugandan uh, community, some representatives of the Somali community, based on even your own personal experience, Andrew, is this a one-off? I mean, is this stuff happening all the time? I mean, is this a common experience for students of color? Well, these, the, Ryan, these are questions that we got to ask the community. And I feel as though the community... 10 months ago, when we marched to the legislative grounds in Edmonton, Alberta, I feel like we made a really big stance. And that wasn't just black people, that was white people, that was Asian people, that was First Nations, Métis, Inuit, that was LGBTQ, that was Christian, that was Muslim, that was American, that was Canadian. That was everyone coming together and saying, look, it's happening in the United States, but it also happens here. What are we going to do to address this effectively? And I have to say this because, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the parents and the boys. We we don't want, I don't want any harm to those boys. Nobody in the black community is saying we want revenge and we want to go and get these guys. We actually want to help those young men figure out what's going on in their lives. They probably got a whole lot of challenges or things going on. Maybe they need supports. Do they need counseling? Do they need uh, a restorative justice? How can we reconcile these communities? How can we bridge the gap between the black community and white community, what stories need to be shared? And also, how can these institutions employ the services of these community organizations that are largely doing this work without them? Like, you know, Black Owned Market is doing incredible work. They've, they've created resources for this family. They created a letter campaign. Um, the Africa Center is currently working with this, this group of, uh, in the family. Uh, Emmanuel and Dunya, I talked to them last night. They're working right hand in hand with mom and Paso. And of course their point person who is Mr. Menya Bakari, who I met on Saturday, um, talked to him on Friday. And he's the point person for the family. They have all supports in place. But my question is, how are we gonna get back to that harmony that Edmonton needs? Like we can't have situations like this happen and then say, well, those guys are, you know, they're, they're getting charged or they're expelled and that's and we're never gonna hear from them again. We got to protect those boys. We got to we got to make sure those boys have that healing moment where they're like, this was a moment that happened in my life, but this isn't the only moment that's happening in my life. I want to find a way to become an active and productive member of society and change the circumstances that led me to even thinking of recording it, thinking of saying the N word or even thinking of beating up that child. Like there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. Um, I won't say that. This is something frequent, but I will say that it is common based on the fact that I've heard so much already from the community who said that happened to me mm. and nothing happened as a result and it scarred me and I just wanted some changes. And I think now in 2021, this is the time to actually do something and not just put out you know, a tweet here, a tweet there, a statement here and a statement there. That's going to do nothing, guys. We actually have to do the work at this point. Well, I totally agree. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think social media has has an immense power um obviously you know messages can be amplified very quickly um you know but but when it comes down to it as well it's it's not real life and we talk right. about slacktivism and how we'll tweet about something or, or like something or retweet something and feel like our work is done here when when really there's evidence that a significant amount of work uh, needs to be done both in the microcosm right like on this playground and and in this school um but also you know, it's a bigger part of society. You referenced Black Lives Matter demonstrations last summer. It was like th these seeds were planted. I had a conversation with a, 
a friend who you know happens to be a vis- visible minority, but but I don't think you have to be. I don't think you're I don't necessarily your ethnicity matters uh, w- w- when you endeavor to see. Um, you know, the, the momentum continue. I think that that's something that would be a shared perspective of many people, regardless of background, maybe even for different reasons. But he invoked talking about Idol No More. And he said, you remember when like the entire country woke up with the Idol No More movement? But if you really and, and then you could maybe make the argument, Andrew, that maybe that led to more momentum behind the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then maybe that's going to we hope lead to more momentum to, to things like maybe the liberals fulfilling their promise to end, you know, water drinking advisories on reserves. I can get off on these tangents, but my point is that that things happen that mobilize millions of people. But what we need to do is realize that after the rallies and after the clever placards and signs, and I'm not taking anything away from that, but then we all need to go to work. And, and it needs to be an ongoing commitment. Agreed. And I'm, I'm just going to add to that because I believe that there's some amazing teachers right now in the district that are doing this work right now. Brody Calvitis, Mr. Dan Scratch. Uh, Rick Stanley, um, uh, Mr. Semenek down at Emmy Zert High School. Uh, there's a School of Black uh, Students Association that is involved. There's civil, ju- there's civil rights groups that are being created. Anti-racism committees are being created. But I think that needs to be embedded into these institutions. I think that you know some of these institutions there are some gaps in there because there's not enough representation or um, authentic representation. So we need the people who are these liaisons or these consultants or these, you know, representatives for these institutions to speak up and speak out. Um, You know, in some cases, like I'm in a vulnerable position, like my job, I work for the board, but I'm here talking about a situation that's happening in the board because it's close to me because that could have been my kid. My kid's five years old. In nine years, he's past those age. If he gets beat up, am I going to sit down and be quiet and say, well, the board or whichever institution has control of this, I still have the right as a dad to say something. And it's not like I'm saying it in a bad way. Like I think that these institutions are horrible and this and that. I'm thinking that we need to merge some of our ideas. The community has ways of addressing situations, of restoring justice, of, of, of reconciliation that should be heard. And I'm waiting for the day where groups like the Black Teachers Association, Bomb Yeg, Africa Center are embedded into these institutions and their information and insights and resources are applied and also compensated because this work largely for a lot of us, we're doing it for free and it's, it's taxing. Like look at social media on Twitter and Instagram, everyone's watching this stuff and they're reliving it. And then what happens when we turn off our screens? We're dealing with those emotions all the time. So I'm hoping we can do something as a city. I know we're the city of champions. There's great people, there's great white people, there's great black people, there's great Asian people, there's great everyone in this city. And we've had movements like this happen and come and go. But I think it's time for us to keep pushing. And I think it's time for our institutions to look in the mirror. And I think it's time for society to look in the mirror and let's do something. Yeah. And Andrew, I think that this is, I mean, you're, you're obviously like a pretty engaged community member. Anybody that knows you knows that, but it's also very evident in the way that you communicate it, it, your passion, your sense of community, your sincerity shines through. Um, but this is a message that, I, I mean, I don't care if you're watching in Victoria or Winnipeg or Halifax or, 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 or for that matter, Kentucky or Frankfurt, uh, this story could resonate with you. The story does resonate with you because it's something that people can relate to or, or come at from a number of different angles, right? And, you know, I, I'd, I'd be curious to know when you, I want to make sure that I give credit where it's due. The, the Black Teachers Association of Alberta, was that Sarah Adamako Ansa that co-founded that with you? Is that? Yes, Queen Sarah is currently doing, <laughs> <laughs> we call her Queen Sarah because everyone who interacts with her, her, her spiritual presence is something so beautiful and last night i talked to sarah for an hour and we just we 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 talked about education we talked about what it was like to be a black man and be a black woman and a black educator and i talked about being a black parent and she talked about her family and the whole entire time we were just saying you know we started this organization this group to address issues like this but the hope was that these issues wouldn't happen or that they would be decreased or that people would see the value in the work that we were doing. And for the longest time, we were ignored. We were dismissed. We were told, you know, we got things under control. And then three weeks later, something would happen and we would be on the scene. And, you know, then other people would come and get on the scene and say, oh, we were doing this. We think it's time that we walk in hand in hand. Like I'm, I'm, I'm completely and totally honest and open to working with any organizations to decrease or eliminate racism, to address anti-racism, 
and inclusion and diversity and to make this city the beautiful city that we all know that it is. The only problem is for, for some institutions, it's like, well, if we let these people involved, it makes us look like we're not doing our job. No, that's not what it is. In our community, if everyone pulls their resources and we get the job done, the job gets done. We don't have to worry about who did this and who did that. We'll yeah. just get the job done together. I was, uh, the reason I, and by the way, with Sarah, if, if I can get personal for a second, um, I, I know you and I both knew her twin brother, David, Adam Akansa, who's just an absolute legend. Uh, may he rest in power. Uh, David uh, David was born with with a heart that couldn't keep up with the rest of them because he was an absolute machine. And I feel like when David passed, uh, that Sarah kind of like inherited. I, I mean, it, it was like it was like she like powered up double time, um, which is really remarkable. I want I wanted to ask you what you and her. Uh, and others involved with the Black Teachers Association of Alberta, if there's been any, you know, I mean, what, what have you, ta- what's been the most striking thing? Has there been like a moment of enlightenment? Has there been an, an epiphany? I mean, did, was there something that you didn't quite realize before you got that group together that, that that's, you know, the, the, the group itself, that, that its uh, existence has, has paved the way for you to better understand? We realized that largely some of the conversations that we were having were within the community and it needed to reach the entire city. It needed to reach all of education. It needed to reach every single organization, whether that's business, that's politics, that's community, that's sports, but every single person needed to start talking about situations like that and this in order to effectively make society better. Like we saw that George Floyd, I didn't even see the George Floyd video. I saw the beginning of it and I turned it off. And Sarah said she did the exact same thing. And she said, what can we do to ensure that Edmonton, Alberta is the safest place in the world? And not only that, what can we do to make sure our students have the supports they need and our black teachers who are usually the one or two black teachers in the entire school, what supports can they get? And how can we develop a relationship with allies who don't necessarily have our skin color, but they are open to new ideas and open to a different version of education where we actually address the fact that anti-racism is necessary. So Sarah and I got together and we started calling up all of our friends. We got on WhatsApp, we reached out to our elders and we said collectively, what can we do in Edmonton and Calgary and Lethbridge and Red Deer to make this city safe? To make sure that we're talking about real situations and not sweeping them under the rug or just putting out one tweet that doesn't even address anything. We actually want it to be on the ground level, meeting with parents, meeting with students, holding professional development sessions and trying to make sure that these institutions create employment opportunities that address this work. So that was one of the lightning rods that got us going. But I'll tell you right now, as soon as the institutions incorporate us and bring us in, that's when things are going to change. Until then, we're just, you know, having handpicked people to do certain work and that's not going to work at all. This is an interesting, I'll, I'll, Andrew, I know you got to get your day rolling here. Uh, Kim on our live chat says, you know, this is the type of thing that's missing from the curriculum that we're talking about. By the way, we'll be talking to uh, Carla Peck tomorrow, right around this time, 905 Mountain, 1105 Eastern live. Uh, they've just launched a new website uh, related to Alberta's curriculum, which is really something that we're certainly interested in following up on. Um, I think the entire country knows that Alberta is is redoing its curriculum right now and that, that early draft editions of the K-6 to curriculum have, have troubled a lot of folks. Um, Andrew Kim says, you know, we need empathy and expectations included in curriculum, not necessarily religion and history. Other people are writing in saying we need anti-racism spelled out in curriculum. Uh, how important? Yeah, I mean, you're clapping almost here. Take us into your thoughts on the role that you think curriculum should play. Well, I know I, it's really good to have like policies and policy announcements and saying that we're working on this and that. What I want to see is when you open up a textbook, the actual term anti-racism and a definition that has been agreed upon by educators, professors, teachers. I want systemic racism to be embedded into the curriculum. I mean, think of all the other terms that they study in social studies. You study genocide. You study the Holocaust. You study war crimes. Can we not embed anti-racism or discrimination or racism or racism awareness? Or can we not address those things 
specifically and not just a small little definition in the margin? Can we have a couple pages in there? Could we have a chapter? Could we talk about civil rights? Can that be embedded into the curriculum? Could we talk about, you know, communities that have, have done amazing things like, like, like the Amber Valley community? Can we talk about the contributions uh, made from our Asian community, from our Muslim community, from all communities? How can we support each other? And unfortunately right now, um, some of these texts don't have it. The, some of the curriculum, uh, I was told that one of the curriculum advisors said that anti-racism was a myth or, you know, that the challenges related to racism was a myth. And I could tell him quite clearly as a black man that if that's a myth, then I, I believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny because <laughs> there's no such, like, I'm living that life right now. I'm seeing black boys getting beaten up and Muslim sisters, hijabs getting taken down. And I'm seeing the Asian community mobilizing, saying stop Asian hate. And all we really want to do is we don't want anyone to feel bad. We're not here to say, oh, white people are bad or these people are bad. We love everybody. We just want you guys to love us and help us and, and hear our stories so that we can become a better society. And I don't I don't think anyone should object to that. I think we should embrace that at this point in time in 2021. Or we can't wait until 2031, 2041, 2051 to see change. We can do it right now, guys. So I'm hoping we get it done. And I believe in the city of Edmonton. I believe in our community. Um, I'm, I'm I'm hoping to start believing in some leaders in these institutions. Uh, and I think I will start to believe more when they start reaching out to our, com our communities and talking to us face to face or screen to screen or whatever it takes or mouth to mouth on the phone, but we can get this stuff done. It's just, we got to stop dragging our feet. We got to stop trying to do it our way and start looking at other ways to get the work done. And more people of color seeking positions as school trustees and more people of color having access and barriers removed to post-secondary education to pursue the dream of becoming a high school teacher or junior high teacher and 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 more people of color feeling welcome and represented at boardroom tables and making decisions and involved in politics and and, and at, at the community level right a community associate right i mean like this right, is right. It's, it's all it's like the, all these conversations that we have they all come together whether you could you could have a conversation about post-secondary tuition and you could tie it into this without stretching too hard you wouldn't hurt yourself exactly and i have to even give a ridiculously huge shout out i just was made aware of this last night that there is a candidate uh for eminent public school board trustee for ward a her name is belen samuel she has been at the forefront she has been on the front lines doing this work committed to the community to the black community to the indigenous community to all communities in the city of edmonton she is the change that i think is necessary uh in eminent public schools and also in education so i couldn't be happy for her she's a eritrean descent so Kamalaha, Kamalaki to all my people from Eritrea. I love you guys. And I think that this is the change that we actually have to see more representation, different voices at the table. And, you know, Edmonton's a beautiful place and we're all just going to learn from each other. And we're all just going to grow and we're all just going to make it better. So Belen doing this work is going to is going to be the change that we need in the city. And I couldn't be happier for her. Mm. I, I, I don't know if this is, is going to take us off on a tangent. I don't know the background to this, but an uh, audience member that uses the handle Adventure Cycling says racism or anti-racist myth says just ask AGP what it was like at the Castle Downs YMCA in the early 2000s. It's no myth at all. What are they talking I know who about? That is. I know who that is. And I'm not going to say his name because, you know, then his Twitter is going to get blown up. But I just want to say, B, thank you for speaking. He was one of our mentors. Uh, he was about 25 year old guy. And, and I got my membership when I was 14. And there was lots of challenges for our kids. There was lots of misinformation. And so we started talking to the members and saying, hey, well, this guy doesn't necessarily have these supports. How can we help him? Or, you know, this guy's got this challenge. How can we help him? Or this person speaks this language. Is there a liaison that can help? And the YMCA, like, embodied everything that the community wanted and they they helped us they sat with us they stayed in the gym they 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 put on basketball games for us they they got us new basketballs we would train with them they let us sometimes even train a little bit later and i was so lucky to be in that atmosphere because literally from there i was able to get a college scholarship i was able to go u of a on scholarship and then go pro because people like this invested time in the community they didn't just say well that's a black kid i don't know anything about him and let me do my life they're like this is an edmontonian he looks different than me but he's got a heart like me he's got legs like me and eyes like me and a smile like me why can't we help these people 
And so I commend B, I'm just going to say B, uh, for, for sending that message because he definitely was around those times where there was miscommunications uh, within the, with, well, towards the black community. He stood up for us. And uh, there's amazing uh, people from Ukraine, from, from, from Eastern European countries that immigrated to this country just like we did from the Caribbean and from Africa. And we're working together. And we're going to make this society better. And we're going to make Edmonton the best city in the city of champions. Again, we just got to do the work. Pretty sweet so, yeah, to hear when a, when, a, when a community hub or a community center embodies what community is supposed to be all about. That's a pretty encouraging story. You've been putting in the work for decades, man. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about you, uh, Andrew, and, and I really appreciate you making I yourself available. I love you available. too, Ryan. You can say you love me, <laughs> Oh, bro. I love okay. you, buddy. I've got no, love, trust me. You. If you, you I know, I was, you. I was telling people, like, when, when this COVID thing is over, like, I mean, unless it's creepy, I'm not going to be creepy, but if people, no. are up, people are up for hugs and high fives, I'm all over hugs and high fives. I just think, honestly, in our city, we got to... You know, get your vaccine, what you got to do and hug each other and and walk hand in hand, go for like, talk to your neighbors. Like my neighbor's so awesome. They're from China. Every time we're out there in the backyard, he, he, he gives me a hot dog. He gives me a beverage. He says, hey, Andrew, how you doing? And the other side, we have uh, neighbors from, from Ukraine and we come outside and we talk to the dad. Sometimes if they don't put their garbage out, I put their garbage out for them or we shovel each other's snow. That's Edmonton. That's hmm. Canada. That's Alberta. That's who we are. That's what we do. We take care of each other. We're not people out there trying to beat people up and do all that stuff. And if we are, we got to rectify that and tell those kids, look, our city, that's not who we are. That's like, if that's who you are, you got to figure out in your heart who you want to be. And I think that's what the parents are going to do moving forward. That's what the community is going to be doing moving forward. I have to give a shout out to Mayor Don Iveson because he contacted me very early in this process and said he wanted to talk to the family and I was able to connect them to the family and he's been working with them. So shout out to the mayor of the city of Edmonton, who's always been amazing. We're going to miss him. And I hope the new candidate is awesome too, but that's what Edmonton is coming together, working for each other and taking care of business and loving each other. So Ryan, I have no problems telling you, I love you, brother. Love you too. Every AGP. white person out there, black person, let's love each other again, guys. Let's, Let's start building. Let's maybe, start building. Maybe and I you, think it's gonna happen. Maybe you should run for mayor. Just planting that seed. <clears throat> are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna help me? Or I'm, well, <laughs> I, I've 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 withheld an official endorsement to this point, which would which would mean that it's up for grabs. So uh, we could probably get that ball rolling pretty quick. That's that's not a basketball pun, but it could be. Um, it's mayor so good. would be a cool job. It would be a mayor, cool job. Yeah, but, uh, I mean it's 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 yeah. a lot of work. I know you're not afraid of a lot of work. No, no um, it re it requires doing all the stuff. Um, I mean, there's a lot of glory stuff. There is, um, but then there's a lot of stuff that's not glorious and it's boring. But 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 it's like tactical policy stuff. And and actually, part of me thinks that I mean, knowing you, um, I think that's where a lot of your skills. I mean, you're you're a great sort of forward-facing guy you're a good face of an organization you're a great spokesperson you can get a crowd going you can inspire people but i also know that you love the nitty-gritty and so hey man hey maybe not this election maybe <laughs> next one is let me let me just if i'm if i'm the first i'm blown away if i'm the first one to plant the seed but if i am i'm i hope that it germinates a little bit I, and who knows what might happen maybe we'll look back to this interview in 10 years and say that was the first time we talked about it you know i i have a great uh well i'll be honest there's I, there's not a, many politicians that I know. Uh, there's a few politicians that I don't really agree with right now. Uh, but I do want to shout out Mayor Don Iveson, uh, David Shepard. He's been incredible. Um, there's some really cool politicians that I dig and that I enjoy. I actually, I think I met Aaron Paquette the other day, and I think he's wonderful. He's got a beautiful story. Um, if the time comes that, you know, maybe one day I would like to run for mayor, I will. But I have zero, 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 zero intention of doing that now. And the reason is I got my two babies, man. I got my son and my daughter, and I love them to death. And I, if I can't have Saturdays with them going to the park and putting a blanket out on the grass and having snacks and playing yeah. soccer, I, I can't say that I'm truly living my life so yeah, uh, my focus and dedication is to my babies um and to my queen and and to my culture um and to of course education being a teacher is the greatest job in the world i have to shout out to all the teachers right now you're dealing with covid you're dealing with being in quarantine and we're online and then we're in class and then we're online we're in class we're trying to get vaccines we're trying to do all this stuff and you're on the front line and i just want to say to all teachers in the city i freaking love you guys um teachers changed my life tom Alniski, Wilma Griffith, um, Mrs. Dragatis, um, Kelly Maroney, teachers changed my, my life. 
And I think now more than ever, we got to start supporting our teachers. Um, and if I can do anything to help that get going, I'm going to, but there's so many others of us talking vocally and getting stuff done. So God bless all of you teachers. Um, after this year, I'm hoping they give us an extra month for vacation because this has been a hell of a year. And uh, I think you guys deserve all the best. So that's my salute and tribute to teachers in the city of Edmonton and province of Alberta. I freaking love you guys. Mm-hmm. They call him AGP. That's Andrew Parker, co-founder of the Black Teachers Association of Alberta. Thank you for this, my man. And we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, Appreciate you. Yeah, I love it. I, you know what I love is that Andrew gets really specific and you can hear it. He's always dropping. He's like, I know that guy. I'll call him B or that's like Mrs. Here or Mr. There. And he like drops and he's like, he, he, he recognizes people. He fills people's tanks, their spirits. Sarah Hoyles, the producer of this show, if we were to put you on the spot, I am putting you on the spot right this minute. <laughs> As a matter of fact, is yeah. there, and I, and I think everybody can answer this question, at least to a certain degree, or at least everybody with the, that is in a privileged position to answer it this way. Which teacher most impacted your life was there one one right away madame dubé madame dubé what was it about madame dubé um she was my drama teacher in junior high in grade seven eight nine at mckernan (laughs) mckernan junior high school and uh she just listened i think that was the biggest thing is she um she made us write journals and uh just basically you know validated just, you know, what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, your thoughts, um, they have value now, not when you're an adult. Yeah. Right now. Samuel G. Brooks, a teacher that made the biggest or made a huge impact on your life. Teacher that made a big or a huge impact on my life. Uh, Rick Michelin was my band teacher through most of, for all of high school, actually. Um, remember him fondly. One of my one of my absolute favorite people. Uh, Tim Cusack, who is now uh, actually one of the superintendents of ECSD, uh, he was my English teacher. He also was one of my teachers in junior high. Got to give a huge shout out to him. Um, God, there's a lot of other ones too. Uh, Mariko Ito at Louis Saint Laurent Catholic High School. People would know her very well because she was the the fiery math teacher that that was blunt and to the point, and you learned so much from yeah. her. So like. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, there's there's my top three shout outs. Oh, right I there. love it. That's great. Mine, I'm going to say mine. Mine, the one that comes to mind right away, Bruce Robertson. He was my grade eight social studies teacher and just an absolute beauty. And he read me like a book. He mm-hmm. just got me. And he and I was a bit of a handful as a kid. I was never a troublemaker, but I was a class clown for sure. You, uh, I know, right? You, that's I, shocking. I rarely applied myself <laughs> to my maximum potential, but I remember it was it was actually a report that I did on Brazil and Bruce Robertson just 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 pushed me in in all the right directions to really put effort into that report and I ended up getting an A plus and I'll remember that was grade 8 so what what are you in grade 8 like 13 or something like 13, that 13 14, 14. Yeah, yeah. so we're talking 30 years ago um, and I still remember how it felt to get that paper back and to have that grade that I knew I had earned A pluses were rare for me I mean Ds were rare too I was in the middle you know and um and I just remember the way that that, that made me feel I remember the investment he made in my life but he also held me accountable like he didn't mess around. He was cool all right up until he wasn't cool uh, because I wasn't being cool. And I've always appreciated that. And one of these days I'm going to have to tell him that to his face. I'm going to have to track him down and tell him to his face. Um, real talkers on the live chat want me to shut the hell up about trying to get Andrew to go into politics. They think it's a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> Linda Ray says you can have way more influence as a teacher and a parent and a community person. You're probably right. Uh, Lala Zaz says find somebody that calls you his queen. Um, we're going to uh, write in just a second. Uh, we'll bump. Uh, we're going to do a, a, an update of the news headlines coming up. We're going to bump that to a little bit later on in the show because we've got a couple of guests standing by right now ready to go. I wanted to take a second to remind you that as we head uh, into spring and then obviously the summer, if curb appeal is number one on your to-do list, the number one thing you need to do right now is go to the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Look for Eden Landscaping or just check them out directly at landscapeedmonton.ca. You're going to see the work that they've been doing for more than 20 years, helping design people's dreams, right? They put them into plans and then they put them into reality. There's a one-stop shop with Eden Landscaping. So whether it's a beautiful stone patio you're looking for, an outdoor cooking center maybe with a pizza oven, what about a swim spa or that fire pit you've always dreamed of? They can do it all at Eden Landscaping. The team at Alta Moving in Storage, uh, big on these pod-style moving containers. This is the new trend when it comes to moving. 
if that's what your summer holds in store, the last thing you want to be doing is, well, you want to say that goodbye to the house that's meant so much to you. Plus, you still have to pack up grandma's old china, but the truck's there and it's rushed and you're sweaty and you're distressed and the entire thing's just a miserable experience. That's the opposite of what happens when you work with Alta Moving and Storage. They customize a plan, locally owned and operated, that works best for you. Check them out online at altastorage.ca. Also a reminder, the team at Kubi Energy, every Monday's show, our first show of the week, they present positive reflections. We want to hear what put a smile on your face. Send us an email to talk at ryanjustprison.com with the subject line, Positive Reflections. Kubi Energy is a Western Canadian-based solar installer based out of Edmonton and Kamloops, in fact. Tesla certified, and all of their installers are electrical apprentices or journeyman electricians. So you know the job is going to be done right from start to finish. Residential, commercial, industrial. It's Kubi Renewable Energy, a proud presenter of Positive Reflections here on Real Talk. Well, this is a tough story for anybody that's involved in in advocacy, Uh, a tough story for anybody that has supervised consumption services on their radar. We know statistically the data proves that they work, that the formula, that the structure works in saving lives. Well, in Edmonton, I know that a lot of hearts are hurting as Boyle Street's services are being shut down. This is an inner city facility for those of you unfamiliar with the city of Edmonton. And for one of our guests, it happens to be the exact location that she worked to get funded uh, in honor of her son, Danny, who passed away due to an accidental overdose a number of years ago. That's Petra Schultz, who's been a wonderful friend of this show uh, and a friend of mine for a long time. She's founder of Mums Stop the Harm. I'm also so grateful that Dr. Elaine Hishka has agreed to join us uh, this morning, an assistant professor at the U of A School of Public Health. Uh, Welcome to the both of you, and and thanks for being here on Real Talk. Petra, let me start with you. Um, This Boyle Street uh, the Boyle Street services. I mean, this is something, mm-hmm. this is a program, this is an initiative that has been a huge part of your advocacy. It's been a result of your advocacy, you could say. Uh, can you take us into this story through your eyes, through your firsthand perspective? Yeah. My son, Danny, died in 2014 uh, from an accidental uh, overdose from what we now consider drug poisoning. Actually, just um, uh, a few, a short walk, just a few minutes away from where we now have the Boyle Street community site. And after he died, I felt that there were, that his death was preventable, that there are things that we can do to keep people safe. And one of those things is make sure that people don't use alone, that there is some with them that can help them, but also people who can connect with individuals, help them uh, get housing and social services and deal with other health issues. So when I had an opportunity to use Danny's story, to share Danny's stories, actually together with Elaine, to get the Edmonton community sites funded, I felt so strongly about it. And um, you know, when the site was opened, it, it felt to me, I felt, sweetheart, this one is for you. I couldn't save you, but there are other people uh, who will be helped through this. And to have this side closed actually on the day when it's seven years to the day that he died, um, it's deeply personal for me because I think of the individuals. I've met some of the people who are using that side and I know how hard it is, how devastating, how abandoned they feel. And I know that they are at risk of dying. And I think about them and their families and it breaks my heart. Dr. Hishka, what what do we know about why it's closing or what's your interpretation of why it's closing? Um, Well, I, I think there's different theories, but you know, the government has said that they are expanding hours at the nearby George Spady, which also offers a supervised consumption service. And um, so essentially Spady now will be open 24 seven, whereas before prior to the pandemic, Boyle Street and Spady covered uh, those that hour, like the 24 hour cycle together. So Boyle Street would be open during the day and then Spady picked up at night. But what they're not mentioning is that um, Boyle Street's SDS has been operating at the Edmonton Convention Center uh, since that location was set up as a uh, shelter during the pandemic. And so um, in instead of moving those booths back, uh, 
and um, allowing them to reopen at Boyle Street alongside Spady's expanded hours. Um, we're actually going to have a cut in service. So uh, right now we have about 15 booths in the inner city that are supervised exception services capacity, right? So they can supervise, you know, 50 people at a time uh, to support them and provide medical care as needed. And what we're moving to now is about nine. So that is a significant service cut. And I think what's really shocking to me is that it's occurring at a time where we've never had more people dying of overdose in Edmonton. So we are in the worst situation we've had. And this is the last time you would think that any government or healthcare provider would um, scale back a proven intervention that saves lives. So Petra, how do you, how do you wrap your mind around that? I mean, how do you interpret it? To, I, to me, it almost seems like the government doesn't care if people die. We know that these sites keep people alive. We know that taking them away uh, will put lives at risk. So I can't see it any other way as that the government doesn't care that their ideology and their focus on, uh, on abstinence-based measures and, and treatment. Treatment is important. We support pre-treatment, but first you have to keep people alive. People who are dead don't go to treatment. Um, so that is just kind of where I can't wrap my head around why they don't see that need to put harm reduction first, especially in, the pan in a pandemic where people have been affected like never before. In January, February, our overdose rates over the previous year have gone up 157%. Um, our organization has grown by 25%. Most of the families grieving, there's so many people that we have already lost. And you'd think that a government would do everything in its power to keep, keep people alive, keep them safe, keep them healthy. So they have a chance at recovery when it's the right time for them. But that is not what we are seeing here. We're seeing the opposite. Uh Elaine, what do we know about, I mean, I know that we've seen the spike in numbers, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious for your informed insight, but the impact of this pandemic or, or the correlation, maybe the pandemic and, and, and a spike um, in overdoses uh, in Alberta, and maybe even if you can comment in, in other jurisdictions, you know, from a year ago until right now, what does the data show? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, basically the reason we have so many people dying every year of overdose in Alberta, and we've had this for since at least 2014, is because of the influx of contaminated drugs into the drug supply. So we've never before in the history of Canada had um, a drug supply that was so highly toxic and so dangerous. And it's really started um, five years ago, six years ago. And during the pandemic, the supply has gone even more toxic. So whereas there had been established kind of supply lines um, and manufacturers and producers that were creating these illegal drugs and then distributing throughout North America, those supply lines were all disrupted um, with travel closures, border closures, and um, uh, those, you know, basically how the pandemic has disrupted everything for everyone. So what we saw now is um, a whole bunch of unreliable, highly toxic drugs moving into the market during the pandemic period. And this has been confirmed with uh, toxicology, like postmortem toxicology from BC, from drug checking samples in um, Ontario and British Columbia. We don't have that kind of um, information in Alberta. It's not public, but um, basically the the main uh, the main driver, it appears from all evidence is, is primarily um, toxic drugs. The second factor that's probably um, not insignificant is that, uh, you know, people who use drugs are just like everyone else. None of us want to get COVID-19. And so everybody is doing what they can to um, self-isolate, to have less social connection, uh, to make less, you know, to be around less people. And the number one factor for fatal overdose is using drugs alone. Uh, so if people are using more and more alone, that is also likely contributing to increased deaths. And that is precisely why supervised exemption services are such an important strategy here, because they give people an option to go and use safely. And, and they have COVID-19 precautions. Like they're just like any other health clinic that is set up to accommodate people who need care and ensure that they don't, um, you know, they're not at risk for COVID-19 when they go there. Um, so I'm, I'm just citing <clears throat> open data here. Um, Sam, if you can take a look at my screen here, open.alberta.ca is where people can find this. This is fentanyl, non-fentanyl related deaths. Um, the number and rate of apparent unintentional opioid poisoning deaths related to any opioid by quarter. And, and people can see certainly in, in the second quarter of 2020, undeniably, there's a big spike there. It's unignorable. Um, Dr. Hishka, what, with regards to policy or programs or investments, or what has government response 
looked like? Has, has anything changed? Yeah, so I think it's really important to be clear, and I'm sorry, Ryan, to do this, but the data you showed are slightly outdated, and we do have um, a little bit more updated data. Great. And basically, what we know is 1,300 people, over 1,300 people died of an overdose death in Alberta last year, and that's more than died of COVID. So, in other words, you're saying it. So, in other not- words, you're saying it's even worse than what we're showing here. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we had a, a horrible spike at the end of last year as well, um, and it basically hasn't it hasn't gone back to pre-pandemic levels. So in 2021, we continue to see um, more than one uh, Edmontonian a day dying of an overdose, and uh, we've had 73 people die in the first two months of this year alone. So it, the problem is extremely acute. Um, it is very serious. It is killing people who are um, largely you know, in their thirties and forties, uh, often men, and we are just not seeing the government give any attention to it. Um, since the onset of the pandemic, you know, there has been a few announcements. We saw the introduction of a new dashboard and that's where I was getting those data from, um, at the end of last year. So that's just an online portal that gives better data on overdose in some ways. Uh, and we also saw the announcement of an app that may be piloted in the summer in Calgary. And if that goes well, will potentially be available, um, sometime in 2022 for the rest of the province. And that's an overdose prevention app that would allow people who are using at home to have a you know measure of safety and potential for 911 response. And you know those apps have been in operation across the country in many jurisdictions. And while they are an important resource for some people, they're definitely not gonna get us out of this uh, crisis alone. And um, aside from that, we have just not seen any attention or any significant investments in overdose prevention and response um, to the to the magnitude that we would require to bring the death rate down. And I think that during the pandemic, that's been very, very difficult to watch and to see our colleagues, Petra knows this, um, like so many colleagues in healthcare that are working to try to support people and they've never had more demand for their care and they just can't meet the needs and there's just no support. And I think this closure is really um, difficult for people working right now because they just feel so unsupported like this is a lost issue and that these lives don't matter Beatrice, is that what they're telling you firsthand that's what we hear from families that's what we hear from individuals who are using um i remember the day when the site opened i i was dropping some stuff off and i was outing out uh, waiting outside and a young man came out and he said hey they're so nice i can't believe it they care and he I'd never met him before, but he was so taken aback with the fact that somebody was nice to him and somebody cared. And that is so much the story that people who use substances problematically feel so often they're let down, they are kicked by the healthcare system. And here they had a place that was there to support them, that understood them, that kept them safe and healthy. And here's another kick, it's taken away. And to say that people can just go to another location, it's not like finding another hairdresser. With a healthcare provider, you have to develop trust. And the site that is closed serves some of the most marginalized Edmontonians, some of the most marginalized people in our city. And they're once again being abandoned. And I wish Minister, Associate Minister Luan would go down there and tell these people that they're shutting it down instead of making these staff do it whose hearts are already broken. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to decide if I even want to get into this. I mean, this is this is also the associate minister that that's trying to blame the opioid crisis on big pharma. So I'm I'm not necessarily sure that this is a guy that's 100 percent committed mm-hmm. to science and evidence and data and reason and uh, which is really devastating on a medical file, uh, which is what yeah. this is. We're talking about a disease here i just uh, you know i mean picture you you put that number in front of us you know overdose rates in edmonton up 157 percent over the previous year if we saw um i don't know diabetes or breast cancer or uh, migraine headaches or just anything uh you know tennis elbow up 157 percent we'd, we'd we'd probably prompt some sort of a serious response because we would see uh you know we were on the you know, our ship was headed toward an iceberg, but there just seems to be not only a lack of urgency. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here with you two, um, Dr. Hishka, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but, but I mean, is Alberta on an Island here or are, are other jurisdictions in Canada 
um, you know, approaching this in a way that you might deem or characterize to be taking it seriously from an ed- evidence-based approach? I would say so. I think um, what we need to recognize is Alberta is one of the worst jurisdictions in the country for overdose deaths. Like, this is not just, you know, oh, this is part of life and we we shouldn't be doing this. Like, there's something very seriously wrong here and it shouldn't be like this and we can fix it and overdose deaths are preventable and you know we are seeing governments across Canada taking this more seriously we're seeing the federal government make significant investments in um, existing services that support people so whether that be uh, treatment or harm reduction interventions but we're also seeing them invest new money in innovations and I think that that's really what's needed here like we can't just keep doing the same things we're doing and think that the outcome will eventually be different. Really, we need to recognize that the illegal drug supply has fundamentally changed in a way that has made it much more dangerous than ever before. And we need to make new policies and programs that recognize that reality. And so, for example, Health Canada has funded millions of dollars of pilot programs um, to connect people who are using illegal opioids to pharmaceutical grade alternatives in the short term so they can help to stabilize themselves. They don't have to be engaged in crime. Um, they can work on improving their health. And you know, if they choose to seek treatment, they can do that as well. And uh, we're seeing those programs piloted across the country, but Alberta has um, publicly declined to uh, implement those programs, um, even with the potential for federal support. And so I think that is you know, very disheartening um, to see that at least other provinces are trying new things and trying to see if it works. And all we're seeing really is the same old, same old. Like um, I will commend the provincial government for investing more in residential treatment programs. Uh, those programs are very helpful for many people and people achieve long-term recovery from them, but we know very clearly that they're not the best treatment for opioid use disorder. At the end of the day, if you want to cut someone's risk of death in half and help them stabilize and achieve long-term like recovery, medication treatment is the gold standard. And um, we haven't, you know, seen significant expansion of that since the previous government um, under this government. We have seen expansion in other areas of the addiction mental health system. It's not a bad thing, but it's not going to help us bring down the overdose death rates. And so anytime that that's used as like, oh, well, we've made this investment, so don't worry. That's that's a good investment, but it shouldn't be used as an excuse for not taking action on overdose because we just we can't let this many people die. We can't, people in their thirties and forties, primarily um, parents, people with children, uh, brothers, sisters, family members, like these lives have value. They are important. Um, they're Albertans and we need to protect them just like we protect everyone else. And I just think it's been, it's been a rough few years because to watch the death rate go up and to see actually a retraction in support for effective services I just never thought I would see that, frankly. Plainly and clearly and powerfully stated, um, Dr. Hish, I'm really grateful that you were able to make some time for us this morning. Uh, and Petra, it's always just such, it feels like an honor every time I talk to you. I, I, I want to recognize that, you know, every single time that you step in front of a microphone or you get behind a podium or you advocate for someone Um, You do it because of a tragic loss in your own life, but you continue to honor Danny's uh, memory, his legacy with every single thing you do, including this interview. And it's never lost on me. And I'm really grateful for your time and for your expertise. And 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 I I just want you to know for what it's worth that this program and this audience uh, will continue to stand in support of your efforts um, and we will make a commitment to take an evidence-based, scientific approach, relying on experts uh, like yourselves as we explore these types of issues. Thank you for making time for us this morning. Thank you so much, Ryan. Really appreciate it. That's uh, Petra Schultz, who's a co-founder of Moms Stop the Harm. I encourage you to check them out online. And uh, Dr. Elaine Hishka as well, um, who, who's just, I mean, if, if, if nationally speaking, uh, she's got a great reputation for the research and, and the policy work that she's done and her, her perception and understanding of these types of issues around safe supply, supervised consumption, and Canada's opioid overdose epidemic. 
We're going to be talking to the mayor of uh, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, Fort McMurray, uh, Mayor Don Scott, in just a moment. Uh, They've declared a state of emergency related to COVID-19. We're going to find out why in just a second. Wanted to take a moment to remind you, when it comes to the sponsors that keep us going each and every day, the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park have been such great friends of ours. And we want you to circle your calendar because the week of May 3rd, we're getting set to roll out some exciting new promos for Real Talkers. And by the way, there's going to be benefits of membership for our Patreon supporters as well. Oh, yeah, they're going to ramp it up even further. We talked to and met with Mark and Michael and Michelle, and they're just so grateful. They said that it's been amazing. You know, as sponsors and advertisers, they look back on their ROI, on their return on investment. They said there's so many people coming through our drive throughs quoting and referencing real talk and saying Jespo sent me and uh, they said we want to do something to show our appreciation so you're going to get specific codes some weeks or months it's going to be a promotion or a special meal and we're super excited to roll that out a reminder that if you're looking to grab something on the go hot or cold this summer why not make it out to Dairy Queen of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park If groceries are on your to-do list today and you haven't yet checked out the brand new Friesen Brothers location in South Edmonton, you're going to make sure you check that out. 15 locations in Alberta. This one blows every other grocery store I've ever seen out of the water. And it's not just because of the Alberta focus, but to me, that's the most striking thing. It's grilling season. You've got your license to grill and they've got so many different options for you, including all the proteins you're looking for. And that includes great veg grown by Alberta producers. Producers. I'm thinking maybe like a maybe like a, a, an olive oil slathered slice of zucchini yes, sliced please. lengthwise, mm. oh, yes, cracked please. pepper, sea salt, Sam. Just the just the grill, like you know, and maybe you go with the double flip so you can get the hash marks on there. You know, oh man, who wants a zucchini? Oh. The, ah. du- the double hash marks are. They're purely cosmetic, but they're entirely important. They're important, don't you think? And it sort yeah. of establishes you. It's like it's like it's like the drummer doing the drum solo, and then, and then when they twirl the stick, and you're like, oh, they're next. Okay, they're <laughs> next level. All right. So that's where you can find it at Friesen Brothers, not not the double grilled zucchini. Although I wouldn't put it past their chef. They got a team of Red Seal chefs out there. They do an unbelievable job. Let's head up uh, north of Edmonton uh, right now. Uh, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo has declared a state of emergency. It's got some of the highest COVID rates in the country, uh, and it's a real problem. And I know that uh, the mayor here uh, is going to want to get the message out, considering where a lot of our audience members check in from uh, his worship, Don Scott. Welcome back to the show, Mayor, and thanks for making time for us today. Oh, it's always good to be on your show, Ryan. So what what leads uh, you know, municipal government to declare a state of emergency? Can you take us into the decision-making and, and what ultimately led you to take that step? Yeah, we had a meeting uh, that was really led by our Indigenous uh, leadership in this region. They are, and it wasn't just one or two Indigenous groups. It was all the Indigenous groups, almost every one, came. And we had an emergency council meeting on Sunday evening. And they universally thought, And they told us a lot of reasons why and why we should declare a state of emergency. And they wanted us to take a number of other steps. But we debated it as a council. And I think it's fair to say that it's something that had been in our minds in any event. But uh, we debated it for uh, several hours. The meeting was about four hours long. And they gave me the mandate at the end of that meeting to declare a state of emergency. And that was it. And the real underlying reason is the COVID situation in this region is is completely out of hand. It's uh, we have a thousand and eighty six cases. We're the number one uh, region in Alberta per capita, and of course Alberta is the worst in Canada. So uh, you know it, it's just a dire situation getting worse, and uh, we're struggling uh, to get other levels of government to respond in the way that we we really want them to. So uh, we uh, this is really an initial step but we think it's a a vitally important one. I know that no mayor wants to step in front of a camera uh, and say, we're the worst. We've got the worst infections in the province, in the province with the worst infections in the country. Uh, How did, how did it get to this point? I mean, have you been, have you been able to put your finger on something? You know, we've heard a lot of different statements, even by the premier yesterday, but one of the problems in this whole situation is we are not being given the information especially the information on what the solutions could be to tackle this issue. I've suggested a a few different things. 
Uh, probably the biggest suggestion I have made is that uh, we have a vaccine distribution plan in Alberta that is really targeting people over the age of 40, except in limited circumstances, those under 40. But we have an extremely young population in our region, as you can imagine, who are working in the oil sands. The average age in our region is 32.7. So when we have a vaccine program that is targeting people that are older than 40, uh, for the most part, we are not hitting the general demographic of our region. So, uh, you know, that's one issue. Another issue is vaccine uh, timing. Uh, we do have a vaccine clinic up here, a large vaccine clinic, but it's only open from 10 to 3.30. And once again, we have shift workers in our region who can't always come in, uh, you know, to match the time when the vaccine clinics are open. So those are two obvious issues that are happening in our region that we think could make a, a big difference. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of suggestions made uh, certainly the oil sands camps uh, deliver flu shots. I think there's an opportunity for oil sands camps to deliver vaccines just as uh, they do the flu shot. So I think there's a ton of opportunities to make a difference. But one of the biggest has got to be supply. We need to get more vaccines, more shots in arms. That's what we always hear from other levels of government is going to make the difference. Mayor, there, can you clear something up for me? Because there, there seems to be a misconception. I know that yesterday the premier, uh, I, I won't say that he pinned all the cases on oil sands camps, but he certainly alluded to that's where a lot of the cases being. But my understanding, and Vince McDermott, uh, a journalist at Fort McMurray today, deserves some credit for pressing the premier on this. My understanding is that if, if I... Uh, live, correct me if I'm wrong. If I live in Hinton or like my home residence, if I pay property taxes in Hinton or 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 like like St. John, uh, my covid case counts there. Right. Not at the oil sands camp. Am I, am I correct? So if I'm seeing numbers in Fort McMurray, those numbers don't include the oil sands camps, even though there may be huge problems there. Correct. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's what uh, we have understood to be the case uh, since this, the beginning of this pandemic. So if you have a case, and uh, even though you might be in a camp in Fort McMurray, it is attributed back to wherever you are from. So the cases that I've reported, the 1,086, does not include whatever number of cases there are in the oil sands camps. Uh, having said that, I can say that uh, for the most part, uh, we're having good communication with our oil sands partners. We have the oversight group called OSCA, the Oil Sands Community Alliance, they are giving us, uh, you know, regular updates. But, you know, the Premier uh, seems to have been delivering some information that the rest of us do not have. So, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to know. We need to understand what's driving the cases up here so that we can really come up with solutions. I'm not looking to blame anyone. I'm looking to come up with solutions so that we can move forward on this issue. Uh, we really need to, uh, you know, come up with several solutions, I would say. We have a meeting with the Minister of Health at noon today, and I'm hoping that uh, that's going to really drive a few solutions forward. Uh, and I was able to have a, a very short discussion with the Premier on Sunday evening, right after we had the meeting. And uh, he seemed open to the idea of, of taking a hard look at Fort McMurray. And I know that they were taking our situation to the COVID cabinet committee yesterday morning, although it doesn't appear that a lot came out of that. They want to wait and see what comes out of this further meeting today at noon. So we'll see where that takes us. So, um, and I know you're not looking to assign blame, but a lot of times if you want to find solutions, there's got to be accountability and we need to determine who's responsible for certain things. I mean, that's going to be part of the solution. So when the premier says there's been a significant amount of unused supply uh, and also says that there's vaccine hesitancy in indigenous communities. Are you seeing that? Is that accurate from, from the mayor's office? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, so I think when you have a vaccine distribution program that's open for people primarily over the age of 40, and then you're not getting the take up that you would expect when the average age is below 40, uh, you know, you can't be surprised that you're not distributing all the vaccines that you might otherwise hope to, or when you have limited hours for vaccine clinics. And the, the part about the indigenous people makes absolutely no sense uh, to me. And it's certainly inconsistent with everything I've observed. The indigenous community is the one that came to us on Sunday evening. Uh, you know, we have a large indigenous uh, community here. It's 9% of the population, but it's not uh, the way the premier described. Uh, and certainly they have been driving for solutions on this. They, they, they certainly do, 
they have a historical memory of what happened with the Spanish flu. So they're the ones who are really driving uh, this and this issue, I would say, uh, together with uh, with us. They want to see the numbers go down. Mayor, what what does compliance look like in, in your city? I'm, uh, I, I, I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not taking a swipe at Fort McMurray or anything. I'm legitimately curious. I have no idea. A lot of times in communities where you look and say there's been spread here, or there's an outbreak here, you know, it's because maybe people have been gathering, defying health orders, cynical about masks, not sanitizing their hands. There hasn't been buy in, so to speak. How would you characterize how the RM of Wood Buffalo has done on this? Yeah, I would say for the most part, people are complying and I, uh, you know, I have no reason to think that there's not massive uh, non-compliance, but uh, you know, the var- the variants are obviously taking a toll on our the people in this region, and we keep hearing that. And obviously, we do have a young population. I think that's just another factor to take into account. But I have no reason to believe, for the most part, that people are not complying. But they're, uh, you know, it's uh, once again, it's one of the difficulties. The Provincial government is, is certainly not giving us the information uh, that I think would be helpful for us to know how to tackle this issue. And it's one of the you know, concerns that I've been raising. And I had a chance to talk to the federal minister of health yesterday. We raised the same issue. You know, we're not getting the information we need to tackle this issue. So uh, what did the federal minister, by the way, say to you? Uh, she had several solutions, and her office is going to work with our uh, our administration and see if they can come up with some solutions as well. They talked about the rapid testing kits uh, as being a potential solution, and then they talked about vaccine supply uh, as being an obvious potential solution. So they're taking a hard look at both of those issues, and they're now that they kind of understand the situation better after our discussion yesterday, they're going to have further discussions with administration to see exactly what can be done. Uh, But one thing that I I like uh, about the Ontario approach is they declare an area, uh, you know, when they have an outbreak, uh, you know, they call it that, they recognize that and they focus on making sure that that area gets special attention or extra attention. And uh, that's one of the difficulties I'm seeing in this region is that we are currently not getting that, that special attention or uh, there's no difference. Like we are treated every, like every other part of Alberta right now, which under normal circumstances might make perfect sense. But unfortunately, uh, the outbreak is not treating us like every other part of Alberta. Yeah, and and residents in Fort McMurray know know a thing or two of, about emergency situations that require focused, disproportionate response to the rest of the province. I mean, I think that there's probably some wildfire analogies here, Mayor. But but for all intents and purposes, I'll leave them alone. So so the state of emergency here does what it gets. It, it gets talk shows like this reaching out to you. It certainly puts the story all over the radar. It gets everybody's attention. Um, but aside from public awareness, what, what else changes and how long do you see this staying in place? Yeah, it positions us to take further steps. Should we need them? It stays in place for 90 days, but I can rescind it at any time. And, uh, what I expect to have happen is the council's, uh, going to be having a meeting tonight. I think administration is going to be coming forward is what I expect, uh, with a series of recommendations, or they'll tell us that no further steps are required at this time based on the meetings that we've had. Uh, there's going to be some progress made. So we'll see where it goes, but uh, it positions us to take additional steps should they be needed. Mayor, before I let you go, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I believe it was the last time we spoke, maybe it was a couple of times ago, about 911 dispatch being uh, centralized. And of course, we we had fire chiefs on from uh, from Fort McMurray, from Red Deer, from Lethbridge, and, and we've spoken to them in Calgary as well, as well as mayors, yourself and your colleagues um, what's changed or what update can you give us now that we're a couple of months into this, uh, the, the centralized 911 dispatch, where is that at? Yeah, the, uh, the legal process is just on hold right now. And anybody who's gone through the legal process will know that that's not an uncommon result once legal proceedings have commenced and there's discussions happening. And, uh, you know, we're not sure if they're going to bear the fruit that we all wish that it would, but you know, our fire chief is heavily involved in that, and we'll see if it uh, gets the result that we'd like. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always remain optimistic, uh, not only about the COVID situation, but about EMS as well. I think uh, cooler heads will eventually prevail. Uh, we know we're right on this. We, we're we looking to protect people's health. In my view, that's the most important thing, and that's the primary responsibility of elected officials, and not only our level of government, but the province. So I think, uh, you know, when they take a hard look at it and 
look at the data we present, you know, I, I do feel optimistic that uh, they're going to do the right thing. Uh, Mayor Don Scott, Regional Municipality of uh, Wood Buffalo. Mayor Fort McMurray, essentially, sure, appreciate you appearing on the show, making time for us on short notice. Thanks for this. Always happy to be with you. Yeah, yeah we, we know we have audience members up in, in that part of northern Alberta. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can hit us up on the hashtag uh, RealTalkRJ, uh, or, of course, you can send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We're seeing, seeing a, a lot of feedback on Twitter right now, including on our, our previous interview um, with Petra Schultz and, and uh, Dr. Elaine Hishka. And, and uh, please do keep those comments coming. We want to get to as many as we can. We, we very much care about what you make of what you're hearing or seeing on the show, how you're processing it. Um, Doug Darwish chiming in on Twitter using that hashtag um, says with regards to closing these supervised consumption sites, it says it's like the, you know, the UCP scorched earth policy. He says it's a, it's a disgusting continued attack on addiction and mental health supports. Uh, Boyle Street and, and Spady are essential services. This is policy paralysis, failure to act, refusal to act or acting too late. That from Doug Darwish, I appreciate that tweet. You know, park power each and every day, not only powering our hashtag, but providing Albertans with internet, electricity, and natural gas services. And uh, hey, if this is your first time joining us on the show, you may be interested to know that at the, at the click of a button or two, you can change your service provider. That's the way it goes. And if you bring your services over to Park Power, you bring your business over there and use the hashtag 2021-RealTalk when you sign up, they're going to knock 70 bucks off your first bill. I've been encouraging you over the past couple of weeks to follow Park Power on social media. I love their Instagram. They got tips on cutting down your power usage. A power company that wants you to use less. I appreciate that. I also like the fact that they give 10% of their profits. 10%. To local nonprofits in the communities where they live and work. You can find out more at parkpower.ca. Also, a big shout out to the team at Clean Air Club. They want you to save money and breathe easy. You go to cleanairclub.ca right now, you sign up, let them know it's simple what size furnace filter you need. It's stamped right on the side of the furnace filter. That's the big cardboard box, the thin, narrow box that's wedged into your furnace. You know, you're supposed to change it. They want you to make sure that your family is breathing the cleanest air possible. Probably. In the last hundred years, we've not spent a year focusing on clean air as much as we have this past year. You'll pay less than you do in stores. They'll drop it off on your doorstep via cleanairclub.ca. Well, we had a powerful conversation with an emergency doctor, Joe Vipon, yesterday on the show. If you missed it, it was the first interview that we did. Uh, an ER, ER doc out of Calgary that was talking to us, first of all, about this spike in cases and the variants and and basically what people need to know is they're processing numbers around new infections and hospitalizations and, and ICU admissions. The doctor, by the way, said there was some good news. He, he pointed at vaccines and he said, we're seeing fewer and fewer deaths. He said, that's a good thing. So it's not all doom and gloom. But one of the things that's really troubling as we learn more and more about it is, is long COVID. And we talked to a couple of COVID survivors yesterday, a mother-daughter duo, both of them doctors, uh, and if you missed that interview, make sure you check it out. They told us about the longer term effects, you know, and, and many of you responded to that. We asked you to use our hashtag and, and to share with us your long COVID stories. And here's what some of you had to say to us. These are the tweets that you passed along to us when we asked about your long COVID stories. These are people, keep in mind, that statistically are recovered, right? These are recovered cases. So Mina, for example, sent us a tweet. She says, month number five. Taste comes and goes. My sense of smell, non-existent. What about this one from Courtney? Courtney says, I tested positive in early December. Almost five months later, I still struggle to exercise. It says for 20 years, by the way, I was working out four or five times a week. 90% of all taste and smell. Courtney says, I mean everything. Like air, water, everything tastes like hot garbage. Says, I'm far from recovered. Imagine breathing in and it tastes like hot garbage. Colin says, I've been lucky in that my long COVID hasn't been as bad as many others. Says, I'm almost four months since positive and I still have fatigue issues. But the main problem is that if I overexert myself, typically it leads to two or three days of fever and cough and muscle pain and headaches. Man, oh man. How about this? Milo says, my 19-year-old daughter lost taste and smell in October. She can now somewhat differentiate, somewhat 
differentiate salty and sweet, but mostly everything tastes and smells like mold to her. I mean, imagine that. These are just the ones that were sent to us yesterday, right? I mean, th- these are the ones, th- this is just a handful. Health experts are telling us that between 10 and 20% of people that contract COVID and that get through it will still deal with long COVID. One of them is a criminal lawyer from Edmonton by the name of Ashley Antonio, and her experience uh, has been difficult to say the least. Uh, she contracted COVID back in March of 2020, And 400 days later, she's still experiencing debilitating long COVID. We're so grateful, Ashley, that you've agreed to speak with us this morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can can we ask you about the COVID experience first and and what kind of a toll it took on you? What did it look like? Last March, you would have been, relatively speaking, I mean, probably one of the first in your peer circle to get it. Absolutely. And for a long time. Um, my peers and friends and family all said that they were surprised because I was the only person that they knew that had had COVID and the only person that had been having issues. And it's very sad and alarming, but that has certainly changed. Um, And a number of people that are in that circle now are also experiencing long COVID. So um, it's not something that I wanted to be a a pioneer of, but (laughs) here we are. Yeah, to say the very least. So so when you were sick... Um, you know, you hear some people talk about it and, 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 you know, they'll have relatively mild symptoms. Um, other people will say, and we've had interviews on this show, young people saying, uh, this is the most sick I've ever been times 10, like on their back. We've talked to people that that have been on oxygen. We've talked to a couple people that were in comas, quite frankly. Um, what did it look like for you? What was the experience like and how, how long did it take to, to sort of get to a point where you thought, okay, I'm starting to feel like I'm, you know, quote unquote recovering now. When I was in the initial acute COVID, um, it was in March, so they weren't doing testing unless you were essentially requiring oxygen. So when I phoned 811 and described my symptoms, I had everything except for a cough. And at the time, if you didn't have a cough, you didn't have COVID. So I just assumed it was a stomach flu. Um, It wasn't a pleasant experience, but it wasn't the worst thing I've gone through. After a few days, I started to feel better. And it's like, great, this is over. Perfect. Let's move on with my life now. Um, But then I started to feel better and then it started to get worse again. And then I would have a few good days and then I would get sick again. So I started to suspect something wasn't right, um, but it didn't start to get really, really bad for about six weeks after. And then that was my first hospital admission Um, And at that time, I wasn't able to breathe. I had a very high fever and was having hallucinations. And what eventually got me to the hospital was I couldn't feel the whole left side of my body for about half an hour. So I was worried that I was having a stroke. Um, I guess now I was worried I was having a stroke. At the time, I was quite delirious. And my husband was the one that brought me to the ER. Um, And they ran a battery of tests and everything seemed normal with the exception of my symptoms and how every time I moved, my heart rate would jump up to 160 or 180 just from moving my leg and my oxygen would drop to 70 sometimes just from sitting up. And it was just inexplicable to them at the time. So this, I mean, first of all, terrifying, uh, but second of all, probably pretty difficult to wrap your mind around what's going on. Uh, if I'm understanding clearly, you're saying this is six weeks after you supposedly recovered. Um, yes. What are what are physicians? What are our ER docs? I mean, what does triage look like? What are they telling you at this point? Is this uh, I mean, is it striking you that it's almost new to everybody that this is sort of these are uncharted waters, so to speak? Absolutely. And that made it a lot more terrifying. I've been lucky to have unbelievable doctors at every stage from the emergency room to my long COVID clinic that I'm a part of now but no one knew what was going on. And I mean, even now, a year later, it's still a mystery to everyone. So you can only imagine a year ago, no one could explain anything. Um, The assumption initially was that it was some sort of virus, but as any doctor will tell you, it's really difficult to test for viruses. So they discharged me and said, basically come back. If it doesn't get better, it didn't get better. Um, And I came back and, One of the ER doctors who has 
been life-changing for me. Um, I had read something about people that have had COVID and having persistent lingering symptoms uh, that sounded a lot like mine. So though they couldn't explain anything, and at the time when they gave me COVID tests, they were obviously negative by that time. She referred me to the long COVID clinic um, run out of the U of A and eventually they did an antibody test and confirmed that it was COVID, um, though those antibodies only lasted a few months. And I started the process of going through a battery of testing. I think I, there's eight specialists now that I work with on a regular basis. Um, but I, I may have been the first member of the long COVID clinic in Edmonton. Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and I mean, when you say 400 days, I mean, the, as if I need to tell you this, Ashley, but the terrible thing is that, you know, you, you've been going through this now, uh, you know, for what, 14 months plus, um, do you, do you literally, I mean, is it when you describe waking up and feeling a certain way or the onset of symptoms, some of them that are unfortunately so familiar to you at this point, do you have, I mean, are there, are there things that trigger it? Do you even know when it's going to happen? I mean, you, you, you've committed to doing this interview with us. Is it quite possible that you'd have woken up this morning and just been into one? I mean, is that kind of how it flares up without warning? It's usually, um, I usually get a good, now I get a good week every month and then things I'm able to predict when the relapse is going to happen because things kind of, I'm an old hat at it now. <laughs> my stomach issues start and then my head issues start, my vision blurs, my ears start ringing, my joints get unbearable and it just follows, um, follows its usual progression. The, I think the most frustrating part of it though, especially in the career that I have is the brain fog. And I know a lot of people talk about it, but um, I think the most difficult part is that we use words that are quite common words like fatigue and brain fog and a headache, and they just don't describe the, the severity and the extent. I mean, I suffered from migraines prior to this, and the headaches that I have now are inexplicable and unbearable on a level that my severe migraines never were. The words just don't properly describe how debilitating the condition really is. So, I mean, this is, you know, you're, I mean, as mentioned, you're a lawyer. I, you know, I would imagine we're thinking like, you know, some people in our live chat right now are saying that the economic ramifications of long COVID, we have basically no idea how significant this could be. I mean, it sounds to me, whether, whether you're a lawyer or whether you're a, it doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter what you do for, for your job or your profession. This is the type of thing that could knock you out for a week or a month at a time. Um, as you try to evaluate what your next month or year looks like, how do you, I mean, you seem like a pretty even keel person. How do you approach it? How do you wrap your mind around it? Considering the fact that you're participating in studies to try to help Healthcare professionals better understand this, but but really, I would imagine you feel like maybe even a bit of a guinea pig. Absolutely. I'm a guinea pig. I think my blood has been sent to four different countries at this point. Wow. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to plan your life around this. I don't know if it's going to end, and doctors can't tell me if it's going to end. So it's very frustrating, and especially as I mean, I think most lawyers would attest to being a little bit type A and you like to plan things and have your life in order. And I've just completely lost that ability. Um, I'm very thankful that my colleagues have all been very kind to me and everyone's been very understanding and compassionate. But I know a lot of people aren't that lucky. I also have benefits. A lot of people don't have that. Um, there was a period of five months that I had to be on disability because I wasn't even able to stand up during a shower. Um, and if I had a shower that day, that was the only thing I could do. I would be in bed the other 23 hours and 45 minutes. So this is something that is so unbelievably debilitating that I don't know how it's not going to potentially crush us economically when young, healthy, vibrant people aren't able to have a shower and we don't know if that's going to end for them. Uh, and my husband is a firefighter and I know there's been a few guys as well, very strong 
strong guys that you call in an emergency that aren't able to drive because they don't remember how because of the brain fog wow. and aren't able to work out. And it's just something that we need to be taking more seriously because even if the conservative estimates are true, that it's 10 to 20% of people, if we're looking at 160,000 people in Alberta, that's a huge number of people that are going to be struggling with this. Well, I, and Dr. Vipon said that yesterday when we talked to him out of Calgary. He says, you know, to put it into perspective, even even if you say 10% of cases uh, will wind up as the so-called long haulers or, or, you know, be living with long COVID for an extended period of time, you're talking about, like, on average, approximately between 100 and 180 people a day, right? I mean, that's, that's astounding uh, when you think about it. How is your experience and, and your, your ongoing experience, I mean, your lived experience up until this day, and I hope it all evaporates and goes away, obviously, how has that impacted what you think about COVID, how you talk about COVID, your message to your friends and your message to the public? I mean, people always say if you can put a face to something, if you can personalize a story, it'll be that much more powerful do you think you've had a direct impact on, on your circle of friends, maybe on your colleagues and, and on the general public? Um, I mean, I hope there's been some kind of impact on the general public, but I know with my friends and, and family and circle that's a little bit outside of that, it's made a huge difference being able to put a face to it. And people that knew me before and knew I was working out four days a week, I was very active. I was working 12-hour days. I mean, this was this completely destroyed what my previous life was. Um, and even in terms of relationships, my husband has been phenomenal and the best support I could ask for. But obviously you can imagine this is hard on a marriage. And when you're in your mid thirties, you don't expect to be having to carry your wife out of the shower because she's not able to stand. It's just unimaginable to me. And it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So um, I'm hopeful that putting a face to it can help people see. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of people really do like to remain in denial. I know I've received a lot of messages saying that um, I'm lying and obviously I must have some kind of something wrong with me and I didn't work out before and I was very unhealthy before. And I think people are just very scared that this could be their reality and denial at times is a lot easier. But if you can prevent this and if you can wear your mask and you can have the ability to stay home, it's just, it's an unbearable way to live your life, especially not knowing if there's an end date. And I've been contacted by a number of people in the chronic fatigue community um, who have been struggling with this for 30 years and their lives have been completely upended and, it's horrifying to think that that could be the reality for, for me and for so many other young people. Can I ask of the, of, of the people, I'm assuming you're talking about Twitter that told you that, that your story's fake and that you weren't actually sick or you weren't healthy before. Um, did any of them have real profile pictures? Uh, did any of them use real names? Did, did, did most of them have about nine? Num was it like, was it like Daryl six, five, four, three, seven, five, six? Was like, um, who are, like, I can I just say just for a second, like to, to tell a COVID survivor, a long hauler that's, that's, that's sharing her story with people and sounding an alarm that their story's fake. Uh, to me, it's just. I never advocate violence on this show ever, <laughs> but I think some people need a good cuff across the face and and sometimes i wonder if i might like like i'm talking old school school marm little house on the prairie style <laughs> some of these people i don't know if they just need the strap or what but i just like it just to me and and, and you're chuckling but i i'm actually i joke like this because it actually i would be absolutely enraged if i was you to be called a liar that's very that's been really the one of the harder parts mentally um i am a very even killed calm rational person and i've never dealt with the rage that i felt this year and the anxiety and the frustration um i've i've just never experienced feelings that strong towards other people that i don't know um but 
on Twitter, actually, everyone's been for the most part quite supportive. It was Facebook that was uh. was the the nightmare. So I got off Facebook, and that helped my mental health quite a bit. But I know when one of my stories came out, it it may have been on um, CBC. My mom was watching the the tape on Facebook. And I feel very old. I just said tape watching the video on Facebook. And Some people would say you're old for using the word Facebook, Ashley, but that's fine. Right. It's true. I know. I'm not hip anymore. It's very sad. <laughs> I'm not either. Um, but my mom was looking through the comments and they were saying, well, no, she's not real. And the photo of her is just a stock photo. And my mom was like, actually, I gave birth to her. I can assure you that, that she's real. But yeah, people unfortunately have have lost their minds a bit with this. And it's it's mm. sad because the majority of people have been unbelievably compassionate, empathetic. I know the majority of Albertans are at home. They're following the rules. They're doing their very best. And it is just, unfortunately, a very small minority that have very loud voices. But on the days that it's hard to breathe and I can't get out of bed and I can't walk, yeah, when people say that you're, you're lying about it or you weren't healthy before and there's no change in your life and you're probably not even a lawyer, you get very upset. And it's, it's getting very frustrating at this point, seeing the third wave cascading over all of us and knowing what the ramifications are going to be for so many people, but also hearing that the loudest voices are the ones that are saying it's not true. Yeah. And, and, you know, you don't wish it on anybody, right? I mean, it's not like, yeah. you know, I see there's there was this they called it the Freedom Rally, which was uh, down in southern Alberta. And now Alberta Health Services in, in the south region is urging everybody that was at the so-called Freedom Rally to go get tested because there's been a confirmed case of covid that was at the rally. And I know that everyone will be surprised to hear that nobody there was wearing masks and that nobody there was observing social distancing. Um, and then part of me. Like, like the real jerk in me goes, well, maybe if some of them get COVID, then it might go a long way in convincing them that it's real. But that's the last thing anybody wants. You don't wish COVID on anyone, uh, obviously. Um, but you just, it's tragic in my mind. It's, it's, I mean, regrettable is not a strong enough word. It's tragic that it's like it has to become real to people for them to believe it's real, for them to believe the expert voices. And I just, as a society, I'm just like, when, when we started, and I, and I don't think general society is to this point, but when we see a faction that's that's lost respect for, that's lost uh, trust in institutions around uh, medicine and science, you know, suggesting that that physicians have something to gain by perpetrating an agenda. I mean, just some of the stuff out there. And I get that there are people that think the world's flat and there are people that think all kinds of things. And and, and you know, you, you can't argue with stupid for sure. Uh, but I got to be honest, I'm a little surprised at, at the number of people that I see openly and actively questioning the science from from researchers and professionals. I just and that's something that's going to take me. I don't know if I'll ever be able to wrap my mind around it, quite frankly. No, me neither. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I can't help but feel so, so bad for the healthcare professionals who are so traumatized by what they see. I mean, I can only imagine the nightmare that they face every day when they go to work. And a number of them have contacted me and have been a wonderful support and give me great advice. But they say literally when people are on their deathbeds or about to get intubated, they're still yelling about how they're getting paid by George Soros to infect them with this fake virus. And it's really inexplicable to me. Yeah. Um, and it's very disheartening, but I, I really do think that the majority and the vast majority of people haven't fallen into that trap and are taking it seriously. And I, I really hope that is the case and stays the case. I agree with you, uh, Ashley, uh, you know, as sincere as it gets, uh, we wish you uh, a, the best health outcome here. And I know you were telling me you sent me an email earlier saying like, you know, for you going up the stairs, walking up a flight of stairs can be the type of thing that that forces you to pause and recover. And I just think that that's something that people can relate to. Obviously, yourself, a young person, uh, a healthy lifestyle, and it can happen to you and it can happen to anybody. And you have a powerful story. I'm grateful you've agreed to share it here, to be an open book, so to speak, on Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us. No problem. Thank you so much. You bet. That's Ashley Antonio. Into 400 days, she'd be described as a COVID long hauler. 
uh, living with long COVID and, and obviously doing what she can to help scientists better understand what's going on. We want to continue to receive uh, and, and be able to to amplify your stories and your experiences. Um, this one here from Stacy, who used the hashtag Real Talk RJ. That's our hashtag to tell us about her long COVID experience and, and what a perspective check this is. Let, let's get into this one. It says 14 months in. So Stacy's timeline is, is, is kind of comparable to Ashley's there. She says 14 months in. I can't carry anything up two flights of stairs without stopping for a break in the middle. Tremors in my hands and legs make me feel like I'm shivering all day. The only place I don't hurt is the bath. She says I'm taking three to four hour baths most nights to find some peace. Stacy says I, I don't I, I've gotten, you know, don't know where I am lost in the grocery store. Says I can't find words for things. The other day I asked my mom if she thought my Pomeranian would grow back in my garden. She says, of course, I was talking about my peonies. Or peony says following any book checklist or recipe feels impossible. I have to take it one sentence at a time. I'm trying to plan around the good days. Recovering from the bad ones leaves me nearly unemployable. Who's going to hire somebody who can work four hours a day and then needs three days off? Stacy says the future is bleak, especially for those of us who never had a positive test. Accessing care can depend on results, which is a whole other story. So I reached out to Stacy privately because I knew it was going to happen. I said, if I read this, someone's going to say, well, she didn't get a positive test. How do you know it's COVID? How do you know it's not something else? How do you know it's not meningitis? How do you know it's not Lyme disease? How do you know it's not something else? So I reached out to her. She says, my mom and I were diagnosed clinically. Uh, she said it was early, like March 2020, when tests weren't done for everybody yet. So I, she says, I took my mom to the ER during our quarantine, and the doctor did a chest x-ray and told her that she had COVID lungs uh, so then when my symptoms kicked off by proximity, they diagnosed me as well. She says, I have good days, but they're still the exception, and I always end up paying for them. Stacy's a young woman. She says, I-, I still have to learn to pace myself. I still have to remember that I can't do what I used to do. I'm still grieving the before all this Stacy. She's grieving the loss of her life pre-COVID. She says, my mom's doing all right. She had chronic pain before this, so she's kind of used to that part of it. She's slower. Breathing is really tough. She says she gets a little spicy at all the stuff that's happening in the world right now, like nobody seems to care what the virus can do. And Stacy says, I'm feeling the same way. She says, but we're both happy to be open about it. That's why she's sharing with Real Talk. She says, and go ahead and read my tweet i'm prepared and ready to fight the comments section if i need to <laughs> i don't think she's gonna get a fight i'm not saying she's looking for one but i don't think she's if it hey you know like a buddy of mine said i he says i don't find fights but sometimes fights find me you know and i said well okay she says i i can't thank real talk enough for having a conversation like this she says we we you know she says i'm holding out hope that we can do better on this file that from stacy i sure appreciate that want to get to another story that, that's got people talking about today. It's, it's kind of comical, but it's actually not funny at all. But first, we'll remind you that the team at Westworld Computer is a proud partner of Real Talk. And right now, they're ready to pump up your workouts and your backyard barbecue season with the Sounds of Spring audio promotion. You can save up to 60% off audio products from brands like Beats, Ultimate Ears, JBL, and more. Plus, they carry Sonos. If you've never heard of Sonos, Sonos system in action, do yourself a favor and check it, right? These things can pound. Uh, the entire home Wi-Fi audio system, Westworld is now offering Sonos portable speakers. You can enjoy music, voice control, multi-room listening at home, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth streaming, all-day battery life, and waterproof durability on the go up until the end of this month. So you got, what is it, three, four days left, uh, 12 months at Westworld, No mo- uh, 12 months, no payments, no interest on any Sonos orders. orders. You can find them in person at 170th Street, 103rd avenue in edmonton or at westworld.ca a shout out to the team at local waste local waste integrity is what they're all about and they love to grow their relationships with their partners as their partner's business grows i was talking to their ceo mckell on the phone the other day and he said to me you know ryan i said like what is i said i'm gonna be talking to real talkers what is this integrity as a company core value what does it actually mean because people are just gonna think it's just word salad he goes oh let me tell you exactly what it means he says air is free but it's expensive to dump and i thought about it for a second and i go right he goes all these small businesses paying for the big huge garbage bins they don't need them They're dumping air, and it's expensive to dump. He says, we start you small, 
your business grows, your bin grows. That's how Local Waste runs the business, and it's what it's like to work with them. Locally owned at localwaste.ca. Of course, I don't need to tell you they sponsor Trash Talk each and every Friday. You can send us your rants, your raves, your gripes to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Sarah Hoyle is the producer of this show. Now, day two. Uh, pretty busy show uh, out of the gates today, and we've covered a lot of ground. But uh, to me, I mean, the theme, obviously, we're talking about a lot of things here. Really powerful conversation with Andrew Parker out of the gates. But this long COVID conversation, uh, don't you get the sense that no matter how much time we spend on it, it's still going to be just the beginning of that conversation? Time, unfortunately, is going to need to unfold for us to really understand the impact of this. Yeah, I think, you know, when we look back, once we get more space between now (laughs) and the future um we'll definitely get a a better picture of it i just the thing that i just can't wrap my head around is i don't know if you've ever watched a show like the walking dead like a zombie movie or like zombie land and you know you think come on that can't happen like it will never get that bad and then we watch how people are not heeding you know the the experts the medical experts the science experts and um and now we're seeing the spread. I, I just didn't, I never would have believed it's possible. I never would have believed. Like, I was like, it's too far-fetched. Zombieland is too far-fetched. How do you, how do you feel like, Sam, how do you, when you guys take a look around, the world around you, would you characterize, do you see most people, do you think most people are on board following rules, following regulations? How do you, how do you perceive that? I think so. I think it's another one of those cases of a very vocal minority. Like we're, we're in this place where, yeah, the, the vast majority of people I see in the world wash their hands, carry sanitizer, put masks on, stay away from each other. And, and, and it's just become part of normal life now, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think that that's another thing is, is, you know, we have the, uh, the whole idea of, the COVID protocols are just baked into our existence now. You know, I, I, when I leave the house in the morning, I'm always checking my pockets to make sure I have a mask on me, right? Yeah. And, and it's, it's you know, I, I think that we learned how to deal with this, but then we're just plagued with people that, that still don't think... So. I mean, the biggest thing that jumped out of me in, in that last story was when Ashley talked about doctors will talk about people on their deathbed denying that it's COVID. Like, how much more real does it have to get when you're lying in a hospital bed, dying, and still saying, oh, you're a paid plant, this is not a real thing? You know? It it, it just, it baffles me. And what's the end game? Like, the whole, I don't know, I guess sometimes I think uh, I'm guilty of trying to make sense of something that just doesn't make sense. And so, you know, I mean, what's the end game in figuring out, I mean, you know, denying something that to me is just so, I mean... As a matter of fact, and you know me, I'm not like the person to like put my hands on my hips and be like, that's offensive. Like, I'm offended and that's <laughs> offensive. Uh, but it's absolutely offensive. Like, th- that's why I sort of dug into that a bit with Ashley Antonio. When somebody's like, you survive COVID, not only do you, sur- you, you, so you survive it in a way, but you're continuing to deal with it Um on a daily basis in a debilitating way and people are reaching out on social media to contact you to tell you that either you're not real or your experience isn't real. I, I'm not sure I have the capacity to remain calm through that. I, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. I, uh, I, I, to me, just to, to go back to, you know, that vocal minority, I think what really we need to really kind of look at is who are we, giving oxygen to and I don't mean oxygen in hospital beds I mean you know in media who saying that we need to have um you know equal representation we need to have all voices heard and sometimes um you know it's not uh, yeah the coverage of of someone that's doing a march or or whatnot um I, I don't know that that is representative of of what's actually happening it's a few people and so it's what are we giving life to what are we giving um space to oxygen to whatever however you want yeah to well i mean and this is a bigger conversation yeah. so like you as a producer of a talk show i mean this is a conversation you know we're gonna have these conversations every day we had a conversation yeah. earlier today with andrew parker you know do you show the video of this 14 year old student at rossland school a black boy being beaten by a whole bunch of white boys who are invoking the Mm -hmm. n-word they give him a concussion he's got bruising all over his body he's hospitalized i mean people are writing in saying the word beating is not strong enough for what that was 
You know, this is targeted, racially motivated violence. Um, and I think Andrew brings up some really great points about why it's not worthwhile to share the video. I bet you people could also make compelling points why it is important how the person that videotaped Rodney King being beaten on a California highway uh, many years ago actually further. I mean, you, you, you might argue, you know, did they create the riot? No, I think the police officers created the riot. Um, you know, the, the action, the inaction, the, the court verdict, uh, the lack of accountability, the lack of accountability, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, histories of, uh, I mean, you know, hundreds of years of history. I mean, let's not dig in there. We could go all day. But the point is, the video, did the video of Rodney King's beating do more harm than good? Did the video of George Floyd having his life snuffed out, being murdered by Derek Chauvin, a former police officer, uh, now convicted, now a convicted murderer, Derek Chauvin, um, did the person, that I, and I, I can't even walk a mile in their shoes because they testified tearfully at that trial about how horrible uh, it was a traumatized. They will they will have PTSD for the rest of. I'm talking about the person that filmed it, that recorded it on yeah, their survivors phone. They guilt. will have yeah. they will have survivors guilt and PTSD for the rest of their life. But that video, them recording that video, I think led to the conviction of Derek Chauvin. But, and I, I just feel like, but we need to have a video, really. Like that's that's the world that we're living in. What if there wasn't a video? And how many events have happened that? don't have videos but that's the tragedy absolutely and i mean yesterday we had a discussion behind the scenes where i was like i don't i'm i don't know that we need to show the video yeah and to be honest i have not watched the george floyd video and why have i not because i don't want to exploit the death i don't want to be part of an exploitative um action against someone that lost their life um I know what happened. I don't need to watch the video to know what happened. Um, and it's it's a sad state of affairs that we need to watch videos <laughs> in order to believe that there's racism. The, the thing is, I don't think you're the person that needs to be convinced, Sarah. Like, you know what I mean? Truth. And and, and yeah. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the, there. I'm well, and there. that's just it. And like the video made it real for so many people and it, and it's like the, I mean, you're right the tragedy is that we needed a video the tragedy mm -hmm. is that this video had to happen but um particularly the george floyd video it was necessary to wake people up it was necessary to build a movement around it i i you know and and it's it's such a horrible thing that it's actually necessary but there's a huge segment of the population that still believes institutionalized racism is not a real thing. And this video lays it out as plain as day. So I feel like, you know, we're not the people that need to be convinced. Well, and you're not, but you're not wrong there. But also the video was integral in an arrest being made, in charges Absolutely. being laid, yeah. and in a conviction. I mean, yeah, it's one thing to change people's minds. Uh, it's another thing for justice. I mean, let me read from the Minneapolis police report. Um, not the report, rather, but this was the release. So this is what Minneapolis police sent out on May 25th, 2020, uh, in the hours after, uh, so this, uh, let, let me get into this. Pardon me. Um, I want to make sure that I'm accurate here. So this is what the, this is what came out from the Minneapolis police. Okay. The post begins by saying, uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis police officers responded. And I want everybody, when you're hearing this, uh, I apologize for doing this, but, but the, let the image be in your mind. Like allow you allow and I mean, unless it, you're traumatized, if you need to turn the show off right now, I understand. But but picture the cold heart, picture that look on Derek Chauvin's face uh, as he's got this man cuffed, subdued. With his knee into his neck and the man is gasping, calling for his mom, gasping, saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Bystanders saying, get off him. He can't breathe. I want you to picture that. And then I want you to tell me if this release sent to media and sent to the public describes what your mind is, describes what you saw in that video. Minneapolis police officers responded to a report of a forgery in progress. The suspect appeared to be under the influence. Two officers arrived and located the suspect, a male believed to be in his 40s, in his car. He was ordered to step from the car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. 
He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center by ambulance where he died a short time later. At no time were weapons of any type used by anyone involved in the incident. The Minneapolis Bureau of Criminal Apprehension has been called in to investigate this incident at the request of the Minneapolis PD. No officers were injured in the incident. Body-worn cameras were on and activated during this incident. That's what Minneapolis police officers released. The man was handcuffed after physically resisting He appeared to be suffering medical distress, which might happen if you're in handcuffs with a police officer pressing his knee into your neck for nine minutes. Right. So that's where to me video now. Now, there may be two different conversations here as well. Right. Like, is the video important to have as evidence or is the video appropriate to show on a broadcast? And here's where I, I think it's a big gray area. You know, full disclosure, I've not watched the full nine minutes myself either. I've watched as much as I could um, because I I think sometimes you got to force yourself. But there's videos that I've not watched in life that I've that I've, you know, done my best to get up to speed on so I can offer some commentary on it. And I always try to disclose that I've not seen them fully because I can't I I can think of things that I have seen as as a spot news reporter back in the day, Mm. you know, showing up to calls and like ambulance chasing as you might call it and some of the things you see i mean this i mean never mind what first responders see or never mind what our members of our military see and then walk with for the rest of their lives but i don't know i think uh, to your point the idea that there this is there are two conversations happening simultaneously uh, around you know is it good for evidence absolutely and then the public aspect like should folks be sharing it um i mean yeah, I'm 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 grateful that there was video. I'm grateful that there was video because it took a year more than a year with a video to get this conviction. And you know, with all of those uh witnesses and all the accounts and everything and it still took a year to get that conviction and it wasn't guaranteed. Um so Yes, I'm glad that there's a video, but for public consumption, I'm, I'm not convinced. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, this is, uh, something that, that I think is, is one of these gray areas, which is w- where the show intentionally resides. Like we're not going to, not every story is tied up nicely with a bow and resolved every morning. Not everything is, is black and white or cut and dried or right and wrong. Um, and, and, and sincerely, we, we always want to hear, uh, what you have to say about the things that we're talking about. Your feedback is very important to us. One of the ways that, that we ask you to provide feedback to us is by way of our question of the week. And if you check out our website, ryanjesperson.com, you'll be able to see it right at the top. Our get real question of the week. This week, uh, you know, past Monday, we don't have to tell you, the Liberals released their first federal budget. Um, as a matter of fact, the first budget Canadians have seen federally in two years Uh, The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, joined us the next day exclusively to talk about it. Uh, It involves a $30 billion pledge to develop a national child care program over the next five years. The program would provide offsets to boost availability of early learning programs, train more early learning educators, and reduce daycare costs to about 10 bucks a day. It was a hot topic, obviously, and we're asking you to speak frankly uh, by way of the exercise that takes about two minutes. To answer our question of the week, again, you'll find it on our website. We ask, is it a welcome investment, a cynical attempt at buying votes? Is it something we need or don't need on a national level? And we invite you to check that out. While you're on our website, I also invite you to check out our sponsors page. It's where you can show some love to the partners that have been keeping Real Talk, not just not just here, but we're growing. And there's going to be evidence of it even more in days to come. That includes the team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. You know, they've been talking a lot about this night, the uh, the brand new. Okay, so you've got two things coming up in the Jeep lineup. There's the Grand Cherokee L, which is the third row of seating, the seven-passenger Grand Cherokee, which is an awesome option for a lot of families. And then that Grand Wagoneer, which is absolutely beautiful. The luxury SUV, yeah, six figures, just like the Escalade and just like the big Benzes and the Navigator and everything else, Jeep's in that 
space now making waves. But this 2021 Cherokee Sport 4x4, if budget's more a concern for you, they're right now on sale for $34,990. They've got the 3.2 liter V6 nine speed automatic transmission, the heated leather wrapped steering wheel, heated front seats, remote starter, and that touch screen with integrated Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay. You'll find the best selection of Jeep 4x4s in Alberta at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Also, a quick reminder that you can check out the team at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food at granddog.ca. It's what we feed our dogs. Do I need to say anything more? We see evidence every single day that they're living a healthier life because of this quality raw food. We tap into their team's expertise. They have nutritionists there that can help you develop a custom plan based on the signs your dog's showing you about what the current feeding regimen looks like. Plus, they deliver right to your door in Calgary, Edmonton, and Central Alberta. The code REALTALK will get you 10% off your first order at granddog.ca. Tomorrow's show already in the works. This is the beauty of having a Chase producer on full-time. We're so excited to have Sarah here. We're going to be talking to Carla Peck. We're bringing her back. Check her out on Twitter at CPEC3. She's just launched a great new web resource. If you want to learn more about this curriculum overhaul, Carla will dive into it with us tomorrow morning, and we'll talk to a grief educator. We'll find out what Jeremy Allen's all about. More meaningful conversation to come here on Real Talk. We'll see you then. The gun on.